For centuries, black churches have provided a sanctuary to millions of African Americans. From slaves to free men, from butlers to bankers, from congressmen to CEOs. Black churches are a sacred form of personal identity, which rests the very heart of the African American existence. talking bling and Bentleys and the Bible. There is no secret what God can do. You see my bling. You see my Bentley and you see my glory, but you don't know my story. Today, megachurch ministers like Creflo Dollar. I'm not going to be going to heaven and be broke when I get there. Eddie Long. When you give tithe, when you pay your 10% of gross, you are giving God your faith. And T.D. Jakes. Can I get a witness tonight? Are no longer just holy men. You think you're impressed with this? They're businessmen. And now, reality stars. The sign of God's favor. The Bible says that I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health. I believe that. tradition of the black church always is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, how that is packaged, how that is promoted becomes debatable and becomes uh, the challenge. Black churches are different for a variety of reasons. One is the need to address the social, political, cultural, and economic ramifications of anti-black racism in the United States. There are those who view of preaching the gospel as addressing what they might define as their soul, the spirit. Uh, there are others who view preaching the gospel in a more social context, meaning doing uh, whatever can be done to address what Jesus called the least in society. The role of the black church in people's lives is first of all to have to gain a sense of get a sense of spiritual grounding and then after a sense of spiritual grounding you get a sense of spiritual upliftment and then from acquiring spiritual upliftment you move over to the form of spiritual empowerment well, before and after slavery, the black church played a variety of roles. One reason being it was, to the degree it was possible in the United States, it was independent. Black ministers worked for black people. Black people paid their salaries and safeguarded the institutions. You have a prominent member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, one of the bishops, in fact, Henry McNeil Turner in 1895, in Atlanta, Georgia, the same year that Booker T. Washington gives his speech in Atlanta, Henry McNeil Turner gives a speech in which he argues that God is a Negro and that black folks are mistaken, if not stupid, 
if they worship a god that looks nothing like them. So push forward, and you have figures like James Cone arguing that God is indeed black. Now, how are you going to get a European white Jesus in Palestine? You can't get that. But with white theologians, you can get almost anything out of Jesus. So they had reinterpreted Jesus so he looked like them. But with Cone in the 1960s and these radical black churchmen, you get an effort to bring together the social critique of Malcolm X. We're not asking you to give us some money to make us rich. We put up businesses. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad has set up more businesses than any black man in America. He's not trying to build churches, he's trying to build uh, businesses. Because businesses make jobs for you, and churches don't make jobs for anybody but preachers. And the social gospel of Martin Luther King Jr. in a way that is premised upon the need for the gospel to make radical changes in the life options of black folks. I have a dream. That my poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. There was a time when black churches served a much larger role, shaping black America for the better. During the movement, the civil rights movement, the, the, the black church was headquarters for us. Um, even this facility that we're sitting in right now, the, when the SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, was being formulated, it was launched from New Orleans in a church. Before it even made it to Atlanta, before Dr. King even got involved, it was launched from New Orleans from a church. I think that's kind of where it started, you know, with Martin Luther King. You know, it started with a pastor, you know, just, hey, there's some injustice going on. And I think Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King took his stands, but it was rooted in, in truth. It was rooted in the word of God. A lot of pastors want, would like to escape the responsibility of being civic and community leaders, reserving this, to say that we're just spiritual leaders. No, if the community is attending your church, you are a community leader. I believe that all preachers and ministers should be concerned primarily about the least uh, in society and however they can use their influence to address the needs of the least, they should. This is not to say that all ministers should be activists because that's, that's, that's a special kind of role. They will be found challenging government and and the, and the elite and, and kings, they, didn't, they were not afraid uh, to speak in the name of God to power. Eventually, righteousness will pursue him. Eventually, he will be brought down and justice will roll down like waters. Social justice is the stuff you do when you make enemies, when you have people often want to kill you, when you preach out against war, when you get involved in politics, when you take moral stands that creates enemies. Once I saw the needs of the people in the community, I said, these people need my help, and I'm going to do everything I can to help them. Turner, who understand that Christianity, if it's functioning properly, ought to make a felt difference in the lives of people, right? On one level, it ought to do something to end racism. It ought to do something to end poverty. People's live options ought to be better if they are actually committed to the gospel of Christ. A minister who does not say anything about anybody or any cause and just simply preach a gospel that he is not willing to put into action is a minister really is not worth having. Tithing is not giving. It is a special portion of your increase which God has reserved for himself. Well, a tithing, it, it stems from the biblical mandate to give 10%. Give 10% of what you have to God, and in exchange, God will give you much, much more. Well, if it's not your day to tithe, you may be seated, but tithers that are tithing today, you're going to lift your heart below all over this place because I'm speaking it for you today. And repeat after me, believe in your word to be true. 
I enter a tithe covenant with you, Lord. 40% of the, of the money went to meet the needs of the community at large, poor people. The rest of it went to meet the needs of the poor people that are in, already in the church. There was no such thing as a paid clergy. So black churches, like other churches, have really pushed this tithing because it's a consistent source of revenue. Churches have bills to pay. They have staff to take care of. And the only way to take care of this is to make certain that members of that congregation are giving properly. So I think with fighting the, the social ills in the community, the church needs to prosper. You know, I cannot help the poor and I'm poor. You know, and so I think it's so important to make certain, um, you know, as a church, you know, we are healthy financially. So I would like to see the church go back to the point where it can it can collect um, tithes and offering and keep 10 percent and give away 90 percent. Can you imagine a mega churches who is taking in an essence of 10 to 40 million dollars? tithing 10 percent of their their giving back to the community you don't even believe that the church gets back its 10 10 percent well i don't think that mega churches get back their 10 percent for sure it is no question it is absolutely no question if that was the case atlanta atlanta would not have a poverty issue <laughs> It is called the gospel of prosperity. Religious experts say it's one of the fastest growing ministries in the country. I preach the whole gospel. It's the whole counsel of God. Prosperity is in the Bible, but now the thing is, some people don't teach it in the accuracy and clarity that it needs to be. Mega churches in the prosperity gospel have taken the American dream and translated it through theological and religious language. It has been the perfect marriage of our capitalist system and our religious inclinations. It's like an ATM God. You, you put in, and God delivers financially to you. I define prosperity as every arena of life. Prospering in your spirit, prospering in your soul, prospering in your physical body. That's healthy. So what is prosperity for you? Well, prosperity preaching is talking about you get it, 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 rich. But the word rich, um, that my definition, because I have crocology, definition of rich is, is having crocology. Yes, crocology. My last name is Crockett, so I crock out my way of saying something, all right? So rich is having all of your needs met in abundance with plenty left over. God didn't promise us to be millionaires. He just said we should be abundantly supplied, but then having more than enough to build somebody else. From my perspective, the prosperity gospel is in line with this. It's just not as poetic. There's limited metaphor in place. They just cut to the chase. The Bible says that I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health. I believe that. The Bible holds the key. If you understand the Bible properly, if you live out its principles, God is going to make life good for you. I want everybody to get a $20 seed but there are 25 people that will double it. Right now. And it's very difficult to reconcile that kind of theology when you look at the New Testament. Jesus was homeless. He had no place to lay his head down. So how do you reconcile that with a person that you say you worship who is poor and homeless, who constantly criticized the rich? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine. I thought your hand was going, but you've been praying the Lord. You better watch it. Ten. And I know you sit down, you, but you stand and you debate what should you do. You can't give what you don't have. You can only give what you have. But watch this. We going to give in faith. You know, you go in there, you sing some songs, you clap your feet, you clap your hands, you do some shouting, and you start falling out, and everybody starts loving it. The spirit is moving. Well, I want to know how long can you be in a congregation and you're not moving forward and your life is not changing? Is something wrong with you or something wrong with the ministry that you are a part of? 
And if you're sick, it's because you have a secret sin in your life. Well, that's just perverted beyond perversion. And yet, it's the same pe reason people buy lottery tickets. The gospel of the bling bling, in which the preachers and the rappers are saying virtually the same thing. And unfortunately, it's very attractive in the poorest communities. And so it's affected the black churches more than any other population. Get rich or die trying. Reverend Warnock says prosperity preaching is dangerously out of line with the teachings of Jesus Christ. When preachers fail to speak to that larger social reality, not only are they being irresponsible, in a real sense we become bedfellows uh, with the powers and the principality, pr principalities that oppress the poor. The gospel according to prosperity says that once you confess Christ as your savior, you will become in his favor. And whatever you touch will turn to gold. And that's, that's a complete lie of the gospel. Matter of fact, the gospel says that after you accept Christ, you shall suffer for his sake. So it seems to me on one level, it's an act of bad faith that these ministers are prosperous because of this congregation, knowing all along that there are barriers that are going to prevent members of that congregation from achieving the same thing. In the last three decades, the number of black megachurches has nearly tripled. Each year, they take in over $400 million a year. I'm not concerned about once the money is given to the church and where it goes, what it does with it. That's the thing I have to I just soak my heart, and wherever the money goes, you know, hey. And I look forward to doing that because I truly believe that's where my blessings come from. You tithe? Thankfully, because that's the one thing that God promises in the Bible that if you tithe, Where's the money going? It's a you know small church. You know the money is going for the lights and you know stuff the church needs. But when it's a mega church, it's beyond. For me, it's beyond the church's needs. It becomes uh, the pastor's needs and the family needs is not the church's needs. I think the reason that black mega churches have become really popular in the black community is because the black middle class grew. At the 70s and 80s, we had all these positions of, of, of power and influence that opened up to us. And so people started making more money, we became more affluent. And I think a lot of black people wanted a church to reflect their newfound success. I think if, if there is a need that is being met, people will come to get that need met. So the old Baptist church, the old small church, people getting all happy and falling out and the pastor screaming, that was seen as vulgar, as old timey, as country. They stopped being progressive, but another generation started to come up. And as a result, it was this mass exodus of this is how we used to do church, but man, this is fresher. This is more relevant to me. It's relevant, it's radical, but it's right. You hear a lot of people talk about why they go to these mega churches. It's the fact that you go in there and it looks so posh and opulent. What makes these mega churches so popular? Uh, one of the reasons they're so popular is they have capitalized on the entertainment function of Sunday morning. The churches carry a great deal of showmanship and entertainment and singing and dancing. I hate to say it, but we as African American people, we love entertainment. Instead of evaluating the circumstances for what it truly is, and instead of looking at what the focus of our goals are, we, intend, we tend to get distracted by entertainment. My friend calls some of these mega church pastors, he calls them gospel tainers. They're more gospel tainers. They're like religious entertainers. They bring people in, they fire them up, they make money, they have their festivals, and they, they create a lot of buzz. They sell their tapes and they sell their books, but they're not really trying to change things. They're not really trying to speak truth to power. We just got some lights, we got some television. It's sight and sound generation. And I think, I think people needs are being met. Get ready. Brace yourself for the only DVD of its kind on the planet. Understanding church growth. The DVD. DVD.
Learn as the masters of the ministry unveil their secrets. Mega grow your church in just months from folding chairs to packed out cathedrals. Don't go another Sunday without it. Get your copy today. In religious study, there's something known as the sociology of religion, and it is a uh, concept that is identified as sensationalism. You know, people are drawn to anything that you would label as or characterize as sensational. So church, some churches do the same thing. They have good, a good producer, you know, like people in the movies. I think you should note that last week at Megafest, Tyler Perry gave Bishop T.D. Jakes one million dollars. Hey! <laughs> And the whole auditorium went crazy. The whole auditorium celebrated. The reason why they're celebrating is because church has conditioned the members to think that when you see the pastor blessed, you're going to be blessed. Now, keep you in the chair. God, I thank you for your blessings. So some kind of way, it's an unhealthy attachment, and that's the biggest part of the stamp. Come on, somebody give God some praise. He's pushing that baby out. When people talk about Reverend Creflo Dollar, they mention the Atlanta area mansion, a $2 million apartment in New York, the Learjet, and the Rolls Royce he owns. And you see these guys living like Middle Eastern potentates, that maybe 5 or 10% of the funds that come to the church go to the poor. The rest goes to lifestyles for the rich and famous. And to become a megachurch pastor, you have to keep the majority of the money that you collect, and you have to convince them that they are to give 10% or more of their income, and they should be happy about it. In which way is this jet important for your ministry? Well, in order for me to do what I've been called to do, the airlines, they don't fly my schedule. The private jet has fueled much of the controversy about Creflo Dollar. To try and distort Jesus, to try and justify your new jet plane or your new Rolls Royce, is to me an abomination. It is not just the money they make, it's the way they're treated in the church. Often you will have some of these mega church pastors, you can't even, if you're a member of the church, you can't even see them. He ain't even gonna answer your phone call. Because another thing about these guys is, you can't even talk to them. The pastor doesn't know who you are. You call the pastor, you can't even get through to them. You got a multitude of secretaries and other people. I've heard that. Some of these ministers, pastors, what they call them. So, right. Uh, you can't, you're not allowed to touch them. Well, yeah, that's a, a very uh, famous scripture that they love. They love to invoke, touch not God's anointing. Come on, praise God. Church, Come on. No longer a commoner. He's not on the earth. He's raised from earth into a heavenly realm. He's raised in a prophetic position. He's released. I'll give you an example. I had a friend of mine who was a member of New Birth, and he was diagnosed with cancer, and he was dying. And he wanted to meet with Bishop Long to talk about his death and to help him get through it. Bishop Long didn't have time because he was too busy. He couldn't get an appointment with him. So this guy had to actually leave that church and join a smaller church, and then he developed a relationship with that pastor to help him in his last days. Often, I don't know if it's deliberate or not, but they create this kind of... Uh, aura around them that they are they are they're not just human beings but there's something special that god's anointed and part of that is they always have an entourage bodyguards uh, and then some of them teach that you really, really can't physically touch them because the power is coming through them and you'll mess up their anointing now you ain't gonna get no anointing by touching me that ain't how you get no anointing you can touch me all day long you ain't gonna get no anointing off by, by touching somebody but if he's going to pastor that congregation, like Jesus pastored, like Paul instructed, he must be able to touch, console, hold, pray for, anoint, heal every member of that congregation. What do you make of, a, of someone who's supposed to be man of the people, messenger of God, who doesn't want to be touched? Yeah, you can touch me. Yeah, yeah. I think with a mega church, everybody who come to church not safe. How many people have been shot in church? 
You know, how many times the offering basket is passed around and people run out with it? You know, how many times uh, the church have been raw? This is the downside to mega church. Yeah, this is the downside. So I think you, you got to be wise, but you also need to be touchable. But Jesus tells us very clearly <laughs> that to do his work is dangerous. And so if he want a safe job that he don't want to be touched, or he cannot be touched, then he does not want to be pastor of any church. I originally started out like a lot of the pastors that we covered. I wanted to be in a ministry. I wanted to have the... Um, the whole pastor dream of owning uh, a mega church or operating a mega church. In the aftermath of Katrina, um, I, I, I had a, a family that was in the funeral business and they were overwhelmed. They would reach out to a lot of the pastors and let them know that, hey, we have one of your members here who didn't make it through the storm. And we would, um, like the family has requested for you to come back and perform the service. And a lot of those pastors declined. A lot of them said, I'm too busy, I have too much going on. And one day, Bishop T.D. Jakes was coming down with an initiative with President Bush to assess the damages here in New Orleans. And surprisingly, all of the preachers came back. Pretty much every preacher that we had tried to reach and get them to come and perform the services for their members, well, all of them showed up. And, and I remember watching this saying, wow, we called this guy, he was too busy. We called that guy, he was too busy. And, and I became disgusted. I actually took my Bible and threw it in the trash. I said, you know what, I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to preach. I don't want to do anything. And I was so upset about that event that the next day, actually, we formed a website called pimppreacher.com. I am in Charlotte, North Carolina. A about to head over uh, to Morningstar Baptist Church to um, interact with Pastor Andrew J. Rollinson. Right, the best place is at the back of the line because first shall be last and last shall be first. I can't tell them that we can't go in our church. We can't force your way into a church. We're not forcing. We're, 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 we're members. 50 years, 60 years. You can't keep us out of our own church. I am, I am TJ. I'm with the Church for Revolution. We received a request for help because this pastor was terminated. No, he wasn't. He was terminated by the deacon. We, we have a certified letter okay. showing where the members terminated him okay. and showing where he was kicked. This is Minister Bostic speaking. Now, when Minister Robinson stepped down and go out and go, when we, when we, we have call, just installed him as pastor. Changing the locks. Changing, Changing the locks. Changing <laughs> the locks. <laughs> Thanks to uh, that's, TJ. That's going to be. From New Orleans, huh? mm -hmm, that's what I'm putting on the website. Changing the locks. This pastor was particularly difficult for me to cover on PimpPreacher.com because I, have a tr I had a tremendous amount of respect for him. So I was really slow to cover this situation. When we talk about pimp preachers and we, and, and we cover them, 
this is exhibit A. This is exhibit A. This, when you see something like this, when you see blatant disregard for donations, this is a lack of respect for members right here. This is a pastor that says, you know, no one has the right to question me. What I do with money that's given to this church is my money. It was not only his money, it was the insurance money. If the church is out of $2 million, who gives a contractor $2 million up front if that's the cost to renovate? So $2 million later and the church is having um, service in a school. The, the, the irony here is this church started in a school. This is the pastor's devastation here. So this church could have survived Hurricane Katrina and came out of it with a brand new facility, but they couldn't survive Bishop J.D. Wallace. There's a lot of organizations that are 501c3s. That just means you're not for profit. But the church has a special designation if they're named a church. And that means you don't have to ever report anything to anybody. I'm the direct national director of the National Institute of Church Finance and Administration. We run a certification program for church business administrators. So we credential individuals who work in church offices for as, as business professionals. Most of them have three areas of responsibility, finance, facilities, and personnel. One of our maxims is pastors don't touch money. Is that the business professionals in the office touch the money. The pastor should not have a church checkbook or a church credit card. And I think was, that's where the door gets cracked open for the excesses it's hard to say abuses because so much is elite, it's legal. And, and so much is, uh, you can't really, it's beyond scrutiny because churches aren't required to file tax returns. So they're doing so much that, that's in the dark. You don't really know what's going on. The whole idea of tax free and not having any accountability whatsoever is now a joke. Churches don't pay taxes and they don't have to report income. It is a fundamental problem that these organizations ought to be paying their share. I find it sad when churches come out talking about the need to address poverty within their communities. Well, one easy way to do that would be to pay taxes so that this resource goes into local communities. We there are staggering numbers of houses of worship who are paying no taxes on the police protection, the water sewer services that they get, the sanitation garbage pickup, the fire department, everyone else in the city pays taxes. Whenever you have someone who isn't paying taxes, their share is picked up by the rest of society. One of the things that I found out with 501c3s and churches is that you come across this magical term called reasonable, reasonable compensation. So these pastors are allowed to you know, make money and do these things and create nonprofits to do good. And they get tax breaks in exchange that they're supposed to get reasonable compensation. The taxpayers are subsidizing us. Not only that, the taxpayers in America are paying for the lavish lifestyle of these evangelists. Because you're not going to be audited. There are too many out there. Only way they can get audited is there's some kind of sensational news story. You know, that occasionally it will come along. I think if, if the feds take a closer look at um, this term love offering and tithes, they will begin to see that the majority of that money is in his control. It seems like the tax code hasn't caught up with the reality of these mega churches. In 2007, Uncle Sam finally did catch up. Republican Senator Chuck Grassley launched an investigation into several megachurches. For a moment, it seemed as if megachurches would incur the wrath of God. Senator Chuck Grassley, the ranking Republican on the Senate Finance Committee, began an investigation of six prominent Christian ministries. He wants to know if they have illegally used donations to fund lavish lifestyles. In 2007, after some of these news reports came out about 
the extravagant lifestyles of some of these megachurch pastors, he started sending letters to some of the most well-known, asking him, how do you justify these travel expenses, uh, the ownership of these homes, the money you make, the so-called love offerings you take in? So he wanted more scrutiny on those, those type of expenses. Because they run churches, they do not have to file tax forms with the IRS. So it's unclear how many millions or billions are collected every year. Rolls Royces, Bentleys, corporate jets, $23,000 commode, a marble commode uh, in, a, in a very expensive home. It was definitely an uproar. I mean, you can just go back and look at all the newscasts from that, t from that time. He lived like rock stars with huge mansions, private jets, and fancy cars. No one had ever had the nerve to actually ask the church to turn over their financial records and over to the Senate. You take the uh, Senate Finance Committee and you have to question, do they have a right to uh, in, in, to, in, to invest themselves or to ingest themselves in a position to be tax uh, examiners. Anytime we start an investigation, I find for Grassy, always people are, why me? Why are you looking at us? Why are you, 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 you go coming after us? You know, go after that other fellow. The majority of the phone calls that we received, people were very happy that someone was actually looking at these ministries. Now I have to tell you, um, Eddie Long, New Birth Missionary Baptist Church, Let's just say their responses were incomplete. And Creflo Dollar? Uh, no, we have not given him the information that he's requested, uh, simply because we don't believe we uh, are under any legal obligations to have to do it when the IRS has already been uh, given the authority to uh, act as a tax examiner and not a committee. I think it was frustrating that uh, you know, we would get more cooperation from Enron than we got from some of the, the churches. Well, this is not a First Amendment issue whatsoever. That's not even an issue. We're not interested in doctrine. We aren't interested in what church preaches. This is a tax issue, and our committee has jurisdiction over tax law. This is why we looked at the law, is that I don't think the law really kept up with the times. His lifestyle is the picture of extravagance. He's owned Gulfstream jets, drives a Bentley, and lives in a million dollar home. I don't think anyone ever really anticipated when we gave the parsonage allowance that it was going to be for five, six, seven homes, each of them worth over a million dollars. Uh, you know, that's pretty eye blinking. Like Creflo Dollar, he gets around in style, flying in private jets to preach around the country. I don't necessarily think that they're evil or ruthless capitalists. I do, however, believe that many of these ministers, men and women, are very shrewd business people. More importantly, they have very smart legal counsel who are very adept at getting around the spirit of the tax law. Now, Reverend, you said that you are transparent when it comes to your finances with your members and your board of directors, but not with the general public. Why not with the general public? Well, I just believe that uh, the people that make an investment into the ministry should be the primary uh, ones that we respond to and that we open our books up and we're transparent to uh, versus the watchdog uh, people who just want to get the business to do whatever they do with it. I think that's just a waste of time. Well, I think churches are opposed to review of their financial records, are, are suspicious of transparency because they see themselves as special institutions that really respond to a higher authority. Right, that they are not fundamentally accountable to human leadership, human governments, but they are responsive to the will of God, a, a cosmic and divine authority. When people look at this, they see the wealth. They see all of the money poured into your organization from all of the number of people are there. It also seems to me that uh, another possibility here is that many of these churches know that their financial records are messy at best. The investigation was eventually handed over to a little-known organization called the Evangelical Council for Accountability. The senator has told us he believes legislation should be the last resort. He said, ideas for reform often inspire informed and thoughtful discussions, which in turn lead to self-correction and eliminate the need for legislation. We agree. I think the investigation was a, a big success in the sense of I think it brought forward a lot of these issues. I think it did do a lot of education. I think it did a nice job of engaging the church community. Whatever came of that? Absolutely nothing. 
it, as a matter of fact, they made a mockery of him. Yeah, well, when you look at Creflo Dollar, who all but said, we don't have to show you anything, and then proved it. We're going to give it to them if they're valid requests. He really wasted tax dollars in even starting that process because he wasn't prepared to go all the way. All the way would have been challenging them to, to really open up their books. But they were able to slither away saying that we don't have to open up our books because it, it would expose our donors. It would, it would break the privacy that we have in between us and our donors. Well, if you really had a chance to see what those people were giving, you will see how it is possible for a pastor to pick up $69 million in one year. Well, on that Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability are the attorneys and, a client and, a, and accountants for all these guys that we investigate. And so their recommendation was, we don't think any changes are necessary. So it was just like the, the, the fox guarding the hen house. Church activists all over the country were taking their rage to the streets and the internet. Did you know that there are lying preachers who just want your money? Jake the Snake. They taking money they can be using to pay their light bills, to, to feed their they kids, and giving it to churches every Sunday. And you mean to tell me the church don't got an obligation? Loan the midget. Is it Bentley's? Is it Rolls Royce's mansions? Dollar the rich pimp. Is the preacher being enriched by the tithe of the people? Place is a living lascivious craziness. All these folk. Creflo Dollar is letting everyone know that he's taking the money from the people. Look at that man taking all the money. Yeah, listen to me. Let's settle this. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. They ain't serving God. They serve their own belly. Black mega church has caused the black church to lose its prophetic voice. I do believe that. This is the weird thing. Black churches have become more white, and white churches have become more black. Meaning, black churches are taking more on the theology of white churches, and they're looking their nose down on things like uh, uh, Negro spirituals, certain type of worship experiences, where white churches, like, we want to be more black. We want more emotion. We want more fervor. It's kind of weird what's going on. It's almost the same as the, the Justice Department could not bring down El Capone, but the Internal Revenue <laughs> was able to do it. Well, we're now in the same position, whereas we have this untouchable. These untouchables are pastors. Today, evangelism is billboards and advertisements telling you how to, you're really going to life, your life is really going to be sweet and everything's going to be nice if you give yourself to God or accept Jesus as your personal savior and walk the aisle. Number one, walking the aisle is not in the scriptures. Number two, accepting Jesus as your personal savior isn't in the scriptures. None of that is. As long as the United States operates under this bizarre and delusional thinking that we are a Christian nation and assumes that Christian language is the way to converse and assumes that only people who believe in God, are capable of being moral and ethical, as long as those bizarre things are in place, there will be no real challenge, no real substantive challenge to the ways in which churches and other religious organizations operate. That there's got to be a fundamental cultural shift in the United States before these churches can be held accountable in substantial ways. No, no. I, I just, I think a lot of it would have to come from outrage from the pews. And particularly in a, in a black megachurch, the pastor is so deified. I mean, hardly anything can break the loyalty that a lot of these people feel for their black church pastors. I, they can be the worst scandal, they can be photographs, they can be lawsuits, but people will stick by that black pastor. One of the ways a black megachurch pastor would do it, they'll, they'll use race. They say this is happening because white people can't deal with a strong black man. It's racial persecution, so they'll, they'll, they'll do that. Secondly, there are so many scriptures in, in the Bible about Christians being persecuted. The world will hate you, Jesus says. You know, 
I'm, we're being persecuted. I'm being persecuted because I'm following the godly life. So it'll hit that. And that will condition people to follow them. Thirdly, this is a more subtle thing. And it's kind of hard to even put in words. But a lot of the black church is made up of women. And for a lot of them, the black pastor becomes almost like their surrogate man. It's like their husband that they never had, their son. And so if you attack him, you're like attacking them. You put this stuff together, and it's very difficult to break the hold that a lot of these black megachurch pastors have on their congregation. It makes, to me, it makes their very words suspect. No matter what they say, it's self-dealing. Would you like to hear what I think God would say to the churches in America? He'd say, oh, evil and perverse generation, have I been so long in your midst and you've received me not? Have I not met your needs in a thousand ways and you've been blind? When I speak to you, you do not hear. You behave not as sons and daughters, but as strangers. You hold meetings in my name and give honor to men, but not to me. You boast that you serve me, but in truth you serve your own ego. Save your life under any guise and you shall surely lose it. Offer it up to me this very day, this very second, in a renewal of consecration on a sacrificial living, and I will accept you, and you shall know joy as a new wine.